Welcome to today's to today's speaker series. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm Mei Mei Liang. I'm uh, the division chair for NICBIC and also just have just joined the speaker series organizing committee. So really happy to be here. Um, it's always wonderful to have students involved in this event in various ways. And this week's presenter actually was specifically requested by a student group um, here within the AFE division. And, um, and I was just talking to the students who were involved in bringing Jamie here, our presenter. And it turns out this is a product of a directed study, a political ecology directed study. So I thought this is phenomenal. So I'm going to actually hand the introduction over um, of the presenter to Sarah Birmingham, who is a student of AFE and, um, and yeah. Yeah, so like she said, this is part of a directed study on political ecology, which political ecology essentially brings historical context as well as like specific geographical context to environmental issues. Um, so this one is about, you know, hog farming in North Carolina and worker conditions as well as the environmental impact on BIPOC communities there. Um, and we planned this because we saw it over the summer and we really wanted to also honor like art as a way to inspire action. Um, I think that's a very important piece of, you know, bringing people into food systems work. Um, I can't speak for everyone here, but that's how I'm, that's how I was drawn to this. You know, I went vegetarian a long time ago from seeing documentaries on this, like I wasn't looking at articles. So we really wanted to honor that piece as well. Um, Jamie has worked on multiple documentaries on environmental issues and uh, injustice uh, related to like the pandemic as well. So um, with no further ado, I'll hand it over to Jamie. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really excited. I know there was a lot of a lot of work and a lot of planning that went into this event. So I'm very grateful to you all for for doing that and for bringing me here. Um, like Sarah said, I'm going to talk about worker conditions and environmental racism in the food system with a particular focus on, on North Carolina um, and industrial animal agriculture. So let me get my mic set up here. I don't want to hold this. All right. Um, okay. Okay, great. Um, so very, very brief background about me. I was born and raised in North Carolina in a suburb of Raleigh. Um, I was, you know, like most North Carolinians grew up kind of eating barbecue, eating pork products and not really thinking too much about where those came from. And then I did my undergraduate honors thesis research on my home state's pork industry. And so learning more about the origins of those foods kind of put me on a path um, to become an activist. I've spent about, you know, the 10 years of my career so far uh, working to reform the food system and in, in particular focusing on, on animal agriculture. That has taken me to a lot of different places, including kind of right into the heart of the pork industry. Um, this is a, a clip or just a, a shot of me inside of a CAFO, which I'll talk more about, of course, um, uh, during the process of creating the film. It's been about a six year long journey now to create the documentary, uh, The Smell of Money, which is screening this afternoon at 3.30. Um, and I'm excited to, to share that with you all and to um, talk more about, like you said, the role of, of art in, in reforming the food system. So I do want to give you a sneak peek of it. I'm going to just play the trailer uh, for the film. And this is kind of also a good overview of what I'm going to be speaking about today. They are poisoning our soil, poisoning our groundwater, poisoning people, fellow Americans. Or stealing from women in the present and stealing from future generations does not touch you in an emotional way. You really get in to look at this issue, whether it's from an environmental standpoint, an animal rights issue, whether it's a human rights issue, whether it's an antibiotic use issue, you walk away from this saying, Let me take you three days to sit down and talk with these people. We we'll have to live with this every day. Matter of fact, let me let you live in their shoes for a day. See if it doesn't change your mind. No, I ain't nobody here because I don't do nothing. They don't care because we're black. Back 
up in the country. I just hope my house don't get put up tonight. So I'm sure you're some more people now. You can believe that. You got to pull it on. What makes you think you have a right to set up a hall farm? For a long way to find it. You don't have access to clean air. One of the most disturbing stories that I've heard is the sensation of being free to shit. I have seen this strength feel with feces enduring from this hog operation out of you more than one time. Almost every fish in the river died. Over a million fish died in a period of about a week and a half. Everyone was on this road had a health debate. Every one of them had more health respects than you. People raise animals in this way. Must get at risk. Time that the village stand up, step up, and speak up. If these people have been doing vengeance, destroy it. It's the power to control. That's what drives them to the end of this family. All the laws protect the industries. No one is protecting us. All right, so that's just a preview of the film, um, which you saw this this person. She's the the kind of primary character, the main name main subject of our film. Um, her name is Elsie Herring. She was born and raised on this land that you can see in Duplin County, North Carolina. Um, her grandfather had purchased that land after he was freed from slavery. She was raised there with her siblings and then went off to college in New York and pursued her career there, then came back to North Carolina to take care of her aging mother. And it was there about 30 years ago, um, she and her mother were sitting on the front porch that you see in this photo and started to feel droplets raining down on them. Um, but they knew quickly that it wasn't rain, it was waste from the factory farm or the CAFO next door. Um, the hog farmer had started spraying animal waste and it was landing on on Elsie's and her mother's uh, home. <clears throat> so this started a, a very long battle for Elsie for environmental justice. She fought um, on behalf of her, her family and her community to try to you know, secure access to clean air and, and clean water for, for herself and her neighbors. Um, and she became a poster child for the fight for environmental justice in many ways. So um, I will come back to Elsie, but I just kind of want to take a step back now to talk about what farming looks like now in North Carolina and in many other parts of the world. It's wild to me, and I'm sure it is to many of you, that this is still what appears when you Google the word farm. <laughs> um, you know, these green rolling pastures and red barns and animals on, on open fields. Um, this is still what most Americans picture when we, we think of the word farm. Um, but as I'm sure many of you know, that's, that's not what modern agriculture looks like for the most part today. This is a, a standard hog farm in North Carolina. And um, we now know that about 99% of animals raised for food in the United States are raised in, in facilities like this one. Um, so again, standard, very standard hog farm in North Carolina. And to break this down a little bit further, these are the main components of what uh, we call a CAFO, Concentrated Animal Feeding Operation. Um, so you can see the confinement buildings at the top of the screen where the animals are housed. And um, once those, when those animals defecate and urinate, that waste is swept into uh, basically a large open pit in the ground called a lagoon. Um, they can be the size of, of several football fields and they contain, of course, not only the, the waste from the animals, but also toxic chemicals, various kind of industrial solvents, bacteria, other, other pathogens. Um, and then there to the left, you can see a spray field. So once that lagoon fills up with waste, they, the farmers have to do something with it. And this is their way of, of disposing of the waste. They will pump it onto the field and, and spray it over, over crops um, under the pretext of, of growing, you know, growing food, but really it's, it's a cheap waste disposal method. And here's an image of one of those sprinklers. So it's essentially an, a gigantic industrial sized 
sprinkler that sprays the waste out at a very high volume. And you can see there's there's kind of a mist generated by this, and that's what often can can travel downwind. We know it um, can be found up to up to several miles downwind. And we're talking about a lot of waste. Uh, waste from just two of these facilities, two CAFOs, is roughly equivalent to the amount of waste that the human population of my hometown, Raleigh, produces. So that's about a you know a mid-sized city. It's an extraordinary amount of waste. And there are about there are about as many pigs as people in North Carolina. If that gives you a sense of the volume of this. Again, another photo just of the inside of one of these facilities, so you have a sense of what that looks like. Animals are confined in these pens, and you can see the, the slats on the floors where the, the waste falls through. If you were to ride in a plane or, or fly a drone over eastern North Carolina, this is what you would see. Um, CAFOs there are extremely densely concentrated in that part of the state, which is an issue for a lot of different reasons, one of which is that Eastern North Carolina is a floodplain and is highly prone to flooding from hurricanes and other rain events. Uh, this image is from a hurricane in the mid nineties, Hurricane Floyd that completely inundated farms and um, caused massive spills of those lagoons. Um, kind of a sad anecdote that I find kind of indicative of the way that the industry handles um, handles disasters like this is that in part thanks to uh, watchdog organizations and media coverage of these kinds of catastrophes, uh, the industry now instructs farmers to just keep the animals closed inside, make sure that all the doors are latched so that they the facilities flood and the animals die inside rather than um, having this happen and this you know looks looks bad for the industry. This is another image from that same hurricane. Uh, you can see the lagoon has breached and the waste is just flowing into the into the floodwaters. Um, of course, that you know goes into streams and and eventually into the ocean. Uh, this is a satellite image from after Hurricane Florence in 2018, which broke all the records for flooding in North Carolina and uh, inundated about and, and ruptured about 50 of those hog waste lagoons. As you can imagine, this causes a lot of issues for the environment, for wildlife. Um, this is an image of a uh, fish kill after a lagoon breach in um, a kill in the Noose River. Over a billion fish died in just a matter of a few days in this case. And I wanna just emphasize that this isn't just an issue in hurricane season, which is uh, a terrible time of year in North Carolina, but um, many studies show that hog waste does not stay on the farm, that fields are inundated. Often the waste is over applied and it leaches through the groundwater. It can flow sometimes directly into surface waters and um, causes all kinds of, all kinds of problems. So, um, and, you know, also to note this, this practice is completely legal in North Carolina. The lagoon and spray field system is, is um, standard and, and completely legal and, and largely unregulated, unfortunately. So another image to give you a sense of just how densely concentrated these facilities are. Um, the red dots in this image represent hog CAFOs and the purple represent poultry. Um, these two counties, Sampson County and Duplin County, which is which are the places that we primarily focused um, for our film, are counties with the highest concentration of CAFOs anywhere in the country and almost certainly in the world. Another kind of zoomed in view of that. Another kind of element to note about this story is that relative to other rural areas, this part of North Carolina is is relatively densely populated. Um, so you have these situations quite frequently where homes are located in very close proximity to CAFOs. You can see here the kind of strip of homes highlighted there is um, all one family, multi-generations, uh, multi-generation um, family there. And you know that you can see they're just they're clearly quite surrounded. And this is not an uncommon sort of um, you know uh, way that this this development happens. So the question that we asked 
with uh, with our film was how does this industry impact communities? How does this impact people who live near these facilities? Um, and we met a number of amazing people through the film, and I hope I hope you'll be able to come and and see them, um, hear more about their stories, but also looked at a lot of research to try to understand the answer to that question. Uh, so one of the studies that we looked at was from Duke University, and that found that um, for people who live near areas in North Carolina with a high density of CAFOs, you know, they they live shorter lives. That was one of the big big findings that mortality rates are higher um, even compared to the North Carolina average. This study and others have also documented really high rates of various kinds of illnesses, um, infections, kidney disease, uh, certain types of cancers, anemia, um, asthma and respiratory problems. This is one that we heard almost everyone we spoke with had some kind of respiratory illness in Eastern North Carolina. Uh, higher infant mortality rates, um, higher rates of anxiety and depression. So as you can imagine, living within this kind of um, proximity to a really high concentration of animal waste is, is not pleasant, can cause mental health problems for people. Uh, it also decreases their property values, which is something that people who are already living in poverty, you know, really would struggle with, especially if they're interested in relocating. Many of these families aren't interested in moving because the land has been in their family for, for many, many generations. Um, but if they did want to move, it would be very, very difficult for them to sell their home. Um, and just general lower quality of life, you know, in addition to, to the stench that comes from these um, facilities, people deal with flies and buzzards and other kinds of um, sort of infestations of their, their homes and their land. Um, so it's just a generally very unpleasant uh, experience to live near these kinds of facilities. There's also a reason why we don't see this in Eastern North Carolina, see kind of massive McMansions near these CAFOs. It's not a coincidence that these facilities are located largely in poor black and brown neighborhoods. Um, it's very much a product of the history of slavery in North Carolina and ongoing systemic racism. So this is a map that we included in our film, um, kind of documents or depicts the, the percent of enslaved people and um, so the higher higher concentration, the higher um, the darker red is higher higher population of enslaved people, and the modern kind of um, arrangement of of CAFOs of hog CAFOs. So you can see there's there is a pretty clear overlap in terms of of where hog CAFOs are located. And the researchers who who inspired that map. Um, said in their in their study that industrial hog operations are disproportionately located in areas with high populations of poor blacks who have been disenfranchised in a system that began during slavery and continues today in the form of racially segregated schools, housing, and job opportunities. And they continue to say the pork industry chose these locations because of the lack of local political power and the acceptability in the dominant society of sacrificing poor Blacks, their communities, and the value of their property. So this is considered essentially a textbook case of, of environmental racism, which is the disproportionate harm that polluting industries cause to communities of color and, and poor communities. Um, North Carolina is where the environmental justice movement was born and has it has a long legacy of, of work on this issue of, of being a battleground state. Um, another anecdote that I, I like to share that I think really highlights this is um, as factory farms, as CAFOs were being developed in North Carolina, where that industry was kind of exploding, um, of course, black and brown communities, indigenous communities were speaking up and asking for uh, a halt to that, that growth. Um, but it was only when CAFO was planned to be built near this place, which is Pinehurst, it's a wealthy white community and, and golf resort, that the state actually passed a moratorium on the construction of new CAFOs. So again, it was only when this, this wealthy white community uh, contacted their legislators and say, hey, we're now in the path of this development, um, that the, the legislator, legislature took, took action. 
Um, that moratorium still exists today. So unless CAFOs are developed with new kind of waste management technologies, they cannot be built in North Carolina. But of course, all of the existing ones were, were grandfathered in. So again, I, I think that really highlights the the kind of role that racism and classism play in, in this story. So I'd love to just shift gears a little bit now and talk about workers. And I'm gonna start by talking about slaughterhouse workers. And um, I do wanna show you a video. So this is an interview that we conducted while we were filming um, for the smell of money. And this actually didn't make it into the final cut and we haven't really released it yet. So you all are getting kind of an inside, inside view of I think a really powerful uh, interview. Um, I do want to warn you, it does contain footage from inside a slaughter plant. It's not what I would call graphic or really gory in the sense that there's no kind of overt um, animal abuse or blood or, or anything like that. Um, it's kind of similar to what you would see on the news if you were watching a, you know, a news story about the meatpacking industry. But I know that that can be troubling for people. Um, it also does contain mention of, of uh, sexual violence. So just wanted to flag that as well. Very hard to see, but there is a person here. <laughs> She's just kind of blacked out to prevent her, protect her identity. Like all the benefits are great and the, the money's great and everything else is minimum wage. Of course, you're going to want to take what's more money. And plan with the workout was possibly that I was on the saw, strong wings. The blade was super, super fast. My hands were all day. I kind of scratched there because. Like, well, Sanderson Farms and Butterball, they pay more and they're they're big. Like Sanderson Farms is like working in a nightclub wearing a bunch of oh, around here if you can't leave. On the point system, it's a doctor's note, you only get one point. They give you like two to six points. For sick, you have to go to work. If you hurt yourself, you pretty much have to wrap it up and go back in or you get fired. People do drugs, cocaine, meth, whatever it takes to, to kill the pain so they can go and not get that point. Because if you get a job, a girl with such an age. Swallow the 
They pay a certain amount of money to get a certain amount of immigrants over here or foreigners, I call them foreigners, and it takes them seven days a week, one time go to Rome, seven days a week, 12 hour days. That is slavery. Like one house, and the person that brought them over here, they owe those people. They pay debts for their just pure slaving at these plants and food that brought them over here. So after a year, they'll get their checks, and then they'll be good. They'll be able to get their own houses and all that. But mm -hmm. right, that they'll stop out and have to go back to their main house. I had just walked into the plant and belt broke and it cut her all the way across the face. And Mr. I'm like, I'm on the hair. <laughs> Thanks. So I uh oh, did we lose them? I know the video wasn't coming across very well, but I'm a little worried we lost them all together. Okay, there we go. Uh, gives you a really good sense of just the kind of diversity of, of issues that, that people experience, that workers experience in, in slaughter plants. Um, I want to kind of now step back a little bit and talk about who are these workers, kind of the demographics of this workforce. Um, so the, the majority of, of slaughter plant workers are people of color, Latinx and Black make up the, the majority of, of the workforce. And then um, about 37% of slaughter plant workers are born outside of the United States. Of that 37%, about 70% are not citizens of America. Um, we also know that a large but unknown number of slaughter plant workers are undocumented. And thanks to a variety of uh, media coverage and media investigations, we also know that a good number of slaughter plant workers are children. And this is a, an increasingly um, concerning issue within, within the industry. This is uh, a documentary from, from NBC. 
we also, um, I also really found this compelling. A New York Times investigation found um, child migrant labor in, in Purdue and Tyson plants in Virginia. And thanks to that investigation, um, those companies are now facing federal inquiry into their labor practices. So slaughterhouse work is the most dangerous type of work that you could do in the United States. Um, this graph illustrates, I'm sorry, the text is a little bit small, but injuries in meat processing plants versus, versus other in industries. Um, hog and cattle plants are there at the top, that larger largest red bar, and then poultry plants are there, the other red one not, not far behind. Um, so compared with most other industries or really all under other industries in, in the United States, workers face um, face a lot of hazards, and those include higher rates of serious injuries such as lacerations and amputations, uh, repetitive stress injuries from that kind of all day, all day cutting or, or repetitive movements, um, bacterial infections, sexual violence, um, like we heard in, in that testimonial, that's fairly common domestic violence. Workers experience high rates of this at home, uh, chemical burns. PTSD and anxiety, so plenty of psychological impacts of doing this kind of work, substance abuse and addiction, and uh, compared to most other workers in the United States, slaughter plant workers are, are more likely to live in poverty. I think it's also kind of important to know that um, most of these are likely, almost certainly, underreported. Um, many human rights organizations who have done undercover investigations or just um, you know, general investigations into the meatpacking industry have found that many workers face retaliation uh, if they speak out against um, in their own injuries or plant conditions, and they can lose their jobs or, you know, if they're undocumented or, or migrant workers be deported. So there's, there's a, we know, we know for sure that there are far, far higher rates of, of a lot of these things than, than we actually have documented. Something I've found really troubling in, in my research on this industry is that there is the spillover effect where um, slaughterhouse employment also increases crime and, and, and problems in surrounding communities. So total, higher, higher total arrest rates and arrest rates for violent crimes, rape, and other sex offenses compared with other industries. And again, this is not among slaughter plant workers necessarily, but among people who just live in the surrounding community. Um, so the authors of this study talk about um, just that, that spillover of this place that's so inherently violent and what that can do for people who live nearby. We really got, um, got a glimpse into just how much exploitation workers face through, through the kind of collapse of the, the meat industry during the COVID-19 pandemic. It really highlighted this, this vulnerability that we've been speaking to um, during the pandemic, especially in the early days the the industry required workers to still come into work, provided very few protections for them. You know, they have to stand shoulder to shoulder. And as a result, the, the meat industry was a real source of, of outbreaks. Um, so by mid-2020, about 1 in 11 workers was infected with COVID. 87% um, of those cases were in workers of color. Uh, about 1 in 12 cases in America was tied to slaughter plants. So again, people not just directly involved in the industry, but, but um, put at risk thanks to its actions. Um, plants increased county transmission by 51 to 75 percent. So again, surrounding counties counties uh, experienced this, this spillover. And there have been a lot of reports and, and media coverage that have come out about the industry's um, response to COVID or lack, lack thereof. In many cases, we know that companies like Tyson, for example, uh, lied about the dangers of the virus to workers through interpreters. Um, they underreported cases, uh, stonewalled health departments when they requested data from them um, and attempted to skirt legal liability for, for failing to protect workers from the virus. Um, at the same time, the industry was waging a war in the media 
to to really stoke fear and and um, get people to to think that the this food supply chain was com- completely collapsing. So Tyson, for example, took out a full full page ad in in uh, New York Times and Washington Post saying the food supply chain is breaking. Um, but reports following that, including um, from the White House, found that contrary to what these companies were claiming, their profits were actually skyrocketing. So by mid-2021, this White House report found um, profit margins of the four largest meat packers had grown over 300% from before the pandemic. Um, we also know, thanks to, to uh, exposés of, of what was happening around this time, that a record amount of meat was exported to China. So again, the industry is telling this story of this this collapse of the food supply while they're bringing in record profits and sending a lot of this meat um, overseas. Just a couple more headlines that I think really highlight just the the negligence of this industry and the callousness of of, the way that it, it handled the COVID crisis. Smithfield blamed the quote, living circumstances in certain cultures for one of the largest outbreaks. Um, And then a a lawsuit found that Tyson managers uh, formed a betting ring to bet on how many of their workers would would fall ill. Um, So really just just again highlights kind of the the lack of value that I think this industry places on, on workers' lives. And I'm winding up here, but just want to kind of also bring into the conversation farmers. I consider them workers in this system as well. And I think in many ways they are forced into complicity with the wrongdoing of these these large meat companies. So um, they're forced into these kind of restrictive contracts that really take away all of their freedom in terms of how they they operate their, their farms. Um, saddle them with enormous risk. You know, all of the waste management issues that I mentioned earlier are are on the backs of the farmers to deal with. The, the major corporations have pretty much kind of removed themselves from the equation in terms of dealing with the repercussions of, of the production of that much waste. Um, they also live under a tremendous amount of debt. Uh, so this leads to serious mental and physical health issues for farmers. They have uh, quite high rates of suicide, and a significant number live above the poverty line and have to take on uh, additional jobs to to stay afloat. Um, so this is this is Tom Butler. This is a hog farmer in our film who graciously allowed us onto his farm and and was very very uniquely open with us about the challenges that he faces. Um, he told us, you know, he hasn't had a raise in over twenty years. He's over a million dollars in debt. And he's quite open about the fact that had he known what he was getting himself into by signing the contract that he did those years ago, he he definitely wouldn't have done it. And I think many farmers are in that same kind of situation. Um, so I have hopefully made a strong enough case to you all that we need to reform this system. Um, so you might ask, you know, how do we how do we do that? How do we empty out these CAFOs and, and close them down? Um, I get this question all the time, especially during, uh, you know, after film screenings, people want to know what, what can be done. And, you know, it's, it's hard to answer. There's no one silver, silver bullet. There's no one kind of solution to this problem. Um, but there are so many different nonprofit organizations and policymakers and activists and academics like you all who are working on various sides of this to, to try to address these, these issues. So I'm going to share just a small and pretty incomplete list of some of the approaches that we're all taking. And I'm hoping we can have a little time to talk more about these. Um, so on the policy and regulatory front, I think one of the biggest um, biggest needs here is to reform subsidies. So right now our taxpayer dollars really prop up these industries and give them an unfair advantage uh, in the market. And if we were able to shift subsidies to, to sustainable production that you know really helps the environment and and improves human health, that would be a great step. Um, Also strengthening antitrust laws. So many of the the issues that I spoke to, I think kind of um, are are rooted in this this consolidation of corporate power. Um, Just a few large companies truly control almost all of our food system. That's that's a, a real problem. 
um, strengthening worker protections, environmental protections, and improving enforcement of the existing laws. So there are laws that protect workers in the environment and communities, but they're uh, very, very poorly enforced. And then you all, I'm sure, are, are aware of efforts being, being in the nutrition space to reform dietary guidelines. Um, you know, currently as it stands, our, our federal dietary guidelines are influenced so heavily by the industry that they, they really reflect those corporate interests rather than what we all need to, to, to eat to be healthy. I also think it's important to remember that um, really bringing, bringing people along in this transition to a better food system is, is so important. Um, you might have heard of the term just transition uh, in relation to the climate movement and the effort to build a new climate-friendly economy. I think we need that in, in food and ag as well. So that would involve, you know, investing in rural communities and their economies, making sure that they have strong uh, health care and education and infrastructure, um, investing in green and clean jobs, retraining workers. So, you know, I think it's important that we don't just say we need to shut everything down. We need to think about how are we moving the system forward and bringing the people who rely on this industry for their livelihood, you know, along with us. Um, farmer transitions. There are a number of organizations dedicated to helping support farmers to move out of this industry and to grow sustainable crops um, for their own benefit, that of their communities. And then I think there's there's a lot of promise in investing in in more sustainable alternatives like plant based products. There's been a lot of movement in the past decade or so on this, and I think we're getting to a place hopefully soon where those products are comparable in terms of taste, better for us nutritionally, um, and hopefully soon more more widely accessible and affordable. And finally, there's work done on the consumer and grassroots level. Um, leveraging our purchasing power, something we can all do, um, and also, you know, encouraging the institutions that we're a part of to do that too. You know, universities have large purchasing power. What can we do to be imploring them to, to shift away from, from this system to something better? Cultural change and awareness raising, films and art, um, vote and run for office. I always want to mention to young people, especially don't write off running for office. We really, really need more young people to, to enter in those positions of power and make change from that level. And then finally, organizing and mobilizing for, for policy change and corporate change. I think you can't understate the importance of that kind of grassroots work. Which brings me back to Elsie, a really incredible, incredible community organizer, who again, I hope you'll, you'll come meet in the film. Um, so she, I want to make clear that, you know, she and her fellow, fellow community members were not just victims of this system. They were really fierce advocates for justice. So Elsie uh, worked with her legislators. She held protests and vigils. She spoke at conferences, um, became a spokesperson in the media. So a lot of what she was doing was kind of building power for a lot of the, the solutions that I just mentioned. Um, she brought her concerns to city and town council meetings, uh, testified in front of the U.S. Congress, and most recently she and about 500 other community members sued Smithfield, which is the world's largest pork company, um, in a nine-year-long legal battle, nine-year lawsuit that, um, again, you can learn more about in the film. So I know I've, I've thrown a lot of just kind of facts and information at you, but I do want to emphasize that the movie is much more kind of human centric, much more about telling the stories of the people who are affected by this industry. Um, so I hope you'll you'll be able to come and learn from them and, and hear their voices. And uh, I think you'll be inspired. If you're not able to, to join us this afternoon, the film finally now is available on demand um, on these platforms so you can find it there. And then I would love for you to, to stay in touch with me. This is my contact info, email, um, Instagram. And then if you want to follow the film itself, it's for Smell of Money Doc on uh, Twitter and Instagram and smellofmoneydoc.com for our website. So thank you all so much. I'm excited to, to take any questions that you have. And again, really appreciate you spending your time here with me today and, and being here. So thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Jamie. Um, that was wonderful. And actually, can you tell us just in uh, the, the screening that's happening this afternoon, 
where it is and when it'll be held for those who are interested? Or, oh, yeah, <laughs> great. Let's do that first before Here's questions. Here's the organizers. I might not get it right. Yeah. So it'll be in the cafe at 3.30. The movie's about like hour 40? Hour 20. Oh, the movie's in here. Sorry. But then the panel is immediately following in the cafe. There will be a little bit of food. Um, so come hang out and hear from our lovely panelists and Jamie once again. Thanks, Sarah. Questions for Jamie. Hi, Jamie. Thank you for coming today. Uh, I had a question about what next, right? Because there are lots of different violators around the world when it comes to food production and systems. And many of our students and faculty are interested in researching and being active in these. So what do you have your eye on next? What should we know about? Um, what's been silent? And if you have any information, it'd be great to share. Yeah, thank you. That's a great question. I think, you know, speaking from the North Carolina context and and kind of anyone who's paying attention to what's happening with this industry generally, what people are working on now is this issue around biogas. So um, I think in part in response to criticism of the industry's practices, in particular how it impacts the environment, um, major meat companies are now partnering with big big oil to to go into this industry of creating generating energy from waste. Um, so in North Carolina, you know that looks like them basically taking the lagoons and and capping them and then generating um, you know gas from from that and then piping that through pipelines that they're now building through these very same communities um, to to kind of central places where they can be that that energy can, or that gas can be processed and, and sometimes turned into the, back into the grid. Um, this is something that I think the industry is doing a very good job of branding as a solution, but anybody who's kind of peeling one layer back is seeing that this is, is really just a greenwashing attempt on the industry's parts. It's not actually resolving any of the issues that I described in terms of the lagoon and spray field system, in some cases it actually makes that uh, worse because it concentrates the waste more um, and, and makes it even more, more toxic. And again, like I said, there's this all of this infrastructure being built in these very same communities that in, in and of itself is, is harmful. Um, so this is something that I think is is really scary, again, because there is so much kind of greenwashing happening and even more progressive legislators, policymakers are buying into this and thinking that is a climate friendly solution or environmentally friendly solution. And they're really not thinking about the communities who are, who are impacted by this. Um, we also know, thanks to a couple of recent reports that um, it, in terms of, of climate mitigation, it would actually be a lot better for, and, and more cost effective for us to simply just ask pro or pay producers to stop producing so much. Um, that would actually generate more, um, more, more savings um, in terms of emissions and obviously would be a better approach for a lot of different reasons. But of course the industry is gonna do what makes it the most money. And this is another revenue stream for the industry, uh, another way for it to also just kind of entrench itself, I think by building all of this, this new infrastructure to say, you know, we're gonna be around for a really long time and we're making all these investments. So the Biden administration is unfortunately behind this. Um, a lot of other kind of people on the on the progressive side have have bought into it. And there's a lot of a lot of work, a lot of grassroots organizing in particular happening in North Carolina. Um, and you know, I'll just mention too one one kind of piece of this story that I find especially troubling is that we're now hearing about farmers getting into the business of raising animals in in these capo systems for the purpose of generating biogas because it's so heavily subsidized. It's so lucrative right now that they actually want to generate more manure, you know, so people are expanding their operations or even entering into the business to, to raise animals for the purpose of, of buying or, you know, feeding into that industry. So that's what I have my eye on. I know a lot of other people do too. And um, I think it's definitely something to be aware of and, and to watch. Thank you. For that question. I can pass it. Oh, great. 
Thank you, Matt. And thank you, Jamie. Um, I'm from New Hanover County myself. So we don't have as many hog plants as they do up in Duplin and Pender. But whenever you drive up 40, you could smell it. And I never thought it smelled like money. I thought it smelled like something else. But <laughs> definitely a very creative uh, take on the title. So I've got a I got a question about the documentary filmmaking process itself. It is one of the most impactful ways to bring attention to an issue. But as someone who grew up outside of Raleigh, how did you build community with these communities? And how did you make sure that you were telling their story in a fair way? And I know the easy answer is going to be, well, I just center the, the people that I'm talking about. Uh, but how do you actually do that in practice? Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that question. This is one of my favorite questions to answer because it is really complicated and more nuanced than just, you know, centering people. Um, the real answer is that it took a lot of work and it took a lot of failure. Um, I think as as a documentary filmmaker, you know, your goal is to to go out there and try to tell a story in as captivating and an emotional way as possible. But when you're dealing with real people who are who are fighting systemic oppression, you don't want to replicate that in your own process. And there's a real risk of that, I think, for filmmakers. Um, you know, we had to really try to be careful about balancing our objectives. And actually, one of our, our subjects, Naima, at one point kind of took us aside and told us we weren't striking that well, um, that we were being a little bit too pushy. And that was a huge wake up moment for us and really kind of put me on the path of questioning my own my own racism as a white person doing this work, my own kind of bias that I was bringing into this, the goals that I had as a filmmaker. Um, because at the end of the day, if it's not about centering the community and not about telling their stories in the way that they want them to be told, um, then there's really no point to doing this work and we're causing more harm than good. Um, so I think, you know, one of the kind of approaches we took that I'm glad we had the, the luxury to do um, was to, to just really take our time. So a lot of films, you know, a lot of documentaries take take on average about five or six years. But I think today, because of the pressures of the, the industry and what's happening um, with some of the big production companies, that, that timeline is being really collapsed. And, you know, for us, I think it was important that we just kind of kept showing up, kept showing people that we were going to be dedicated to this fight in the long term, that we weren't just kind of coming in and trying to grab a soundbite or grab grab their story and, and extract that and leave, um, which was the experience that a lot of these people had had with other filmmakers, other journalists. You know, they would just kind of pop in, um, take take an excerpt of their life, basically, and then, you know, disappear and they would never know what happened with it. Um, so I think we just, you know, there's no kind of secret formula to building trust, but a part of it was just continually showing up being open to feedback, you know, we involved, um, involved our participants in the process of creating the film as much as we possibly could in terms of asking them, you know, what do you think we should focus on? What kind of angle do you think we should take on, on these various questions? Um, and then we did screen it for them. So we did invite them to give us feedback on various edits of the film. Um, so Renee Miller, who's one of the main subjects, saw it and, and gave us her, her green light and her thoughts. And Elsie also actually did, Elsie Herring did see, um, did see a version of it as well. Um, so I think that that was kind of one of the ways that we did that. I think another kind of consideration that we've had is involving our subjects in the process of releasing the film. So making them feel like they're, you know, really a part of that that piece of it as well. Um, Renee came up to Toronto for us for our premiere and um, spoke to audiences there and has joined us for a number of other screenings that we've done. Um, she, she can't travel too much, so unfortunately wasn't able to come to this one, but um, you know, to the extent that she's able, she, she participates. But yeah, I think, um, you know, I think there are a lot of young filmmakers now who are challenging kind of the typical approach to documentary filmmaking that really doesn't have the subjects, um, you know, kind of doesn't treat the subjects of a film as priorities. There's even kind of a language shift. You'll, you're hearing me probably refer to people as subjects and participants. I think there's the shift toward kind of thinking of communities as participants in the creation of their own stories. And I think if I were to make another film, there are a lot of things that I would do really differently in, in that sense. And um, I think, you know, we're learning and we're 
we're working on on improving. Um, but I'm grateful that we have had a really strong response from the people who are in the film. They feel very proud of it. Many of them have brought the film to their communities in various ways. Um, we're doing a lot of screenings in in impacted communities. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm happy that they seem to seem to believe that we did a good job with it. But again, a lot learned and I think a lot that we can we can do better in the future. Thank you for that question. Thank you. Elena, do you want to go ahead and ask your question? Yes, thank you very much. Well, first of all, I would love to you know command to all the team for have bravery and have courage and have guts to take this very, very challenging subject. Um, Friedman have a really very special connections with the topic in many regards. And, and one of the, my students 10 years ago, 13 years ago, actually was working on a similar topic, um, speaking about environmental degradation around the uh, CAFA facilities. So I'm very glad to see that the, the topic is still uh, alive, <laughs> not, not in the sense that that's actually a good thing, but in the sense that we are still paying attention and trying to raise awareness about this issue. And I'm very glad that you have mentioned um, your close connections with different um, organizations and different agencies, which probably see the same problem from different angles. I'm very curious, now having experience of building this documentary and acknowledging that it's actually not a simple process at all, what would you do differently if you will, you know, if you will prepare the same type of a movie or same direction of the movie for a graduate students in Friedman or similar institution and for high school students who are way more engaged in the uh, climate change and environmental protections? What is your thoughts if you are switching the audience to a younger generations? Um, what you would be doing differently? Thank you. I, I really appreciate that question. Something that we thought about a lot was reaching young people and engaging them in the creation of the film and, and the um, the distribution of the film. And I think that is one of the biggest areas that we fell short, in my opinion. Um, when we were when we spent time in eastern North Carolina, we were really seeking out young people and wanted them to be involved in, in the process of creating the film. And to the large a large extent, the people we connected with either just didn't want to be involved because they were kind of scared of retaliation or had some more direct kind of tie to the industry. So again, you know, we're, we're worried about their livelihood. Um, and I think they, there's, there was sort of this perception that like, oh, there's a different generation fighting that fight. It was the kind of elder people in the community who had led this sort of organizing effort. And the, you know, when we, we went to community meetings, it was the, the demographic of the room was, was much, much older. Um, and I think that is, it's a real struggle for, was a struggle for us as a, as a filmmaking team, but also is a big struggle for, for people trying to do this work on the ground that there, there's just a drain. Um, I mean, many young people have left Eastern North Carolina. If they have the choice, they don't want to stay there. Um, so I think that that is one of the biggest things that I would do is put more of an effort into trying to engage young people in, in the production process, because if that's the demographic that we're trying to reach on the back end, we have to, to bring them in on the front end too. Um, you know, I think we, we did reach out to some community colleges and, and organizations, youth organizations, but that really didn't lead us anywhere. So, um, you know, eventually we just sort of gave up. And I think if I were to do this again or, or you know, do another film, I would um, prioritize that until we got it right. I think fortunately what I'm seeing is that there is more youth engagement in this issue in North Carolina in particular, even compared to when we started working on the film. Um, the North Carolina Environmental Justice Network, for example, had a had a changeover in leadership where now there's a lot, uh, a lot more kind of youth involved in, in the actual organization itself, um, or younger people, I should say. Um, and so they've been wonderful partners for us in terms of releasing the film, but would love to, to work with them on something in the future. And I think, you know, I think another kind of just big change that I would do that I would make is, you know, I realized recently we never really just asked people, do you even want a documentary made about this issue? We asked them, how do you think it should be made? And that is that was a big realization for me because I'm not sure that the answer would have been yes for some of the people that we worked with. 
Um, you know, I think, especially given the length of the fight that they'd been in, the fact that this has been ongoing for decades, a lot of the people we worked with were just really tired and kind of ready to pass the torch. So it might not have been the right time, you know, to make this film. All in all, I'm really glad that we did. But again, I think, um, you know, for filmmakers kind of coming into this, starting with that question, if you're making a film about an impacted community um, or, you know, people who are experiencing oppression, I think it's it's a matter of asking them, do you even want this? Is this even helpful? Um, I think that goes for research too. You know, I think um, there's a researcher who passed away, unfortunately, some of you may be familiar with, Dr. Steve Wing, who kind of pioneered the research into environmental justice issues in the pork industry. And I think he he really kind of shifted the, the narrative around research and the way that he did that, because rather than going out into Eastern North Carolina and saying, um, you know, I want to do a study on, on air quality and I'm going to measure this particular thing. He went out and said, do you want research? Would that be helpful for your work? And if so, what would you like us to focus on? He was completely community led in terms of how he conducted the research. And even the fact that he did it, you know, was, was based on a, a real need and a real request. Um, so I think kind of like thinking about how to, how to sort of flip the way that some of these things are, are typically done um, and, and, you know, starting with those kinds of questions is, is really important. Um, it's something that I would, would focus on. Great. Thank you so much. Well, on that note, um, once again, Jamie, thank you for coming and, and, and sharing your work with us and looking forward to you guys, as many people attending um, the screening um, later today. So just, I just want to say thank you. For all your work. Very, very interesting. And on that note, one quick announcement. Our last speaker series event is actually next week, next Wednesday. So hope to see you all there. All right, have a good day. Thanks. <laughs>